Okay, it's Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. Last week, we had a chance to look at the life of John, the Apostle John, and he's known as the person who wrote a lot about love, but he was not really tender, weak person. He was very firm in terms of truth. And this week, finally, Jesus sent out those 12 disciples. And this is the initial ministry. It's a little bit different than Great Commission captured in Matthew 28. You had to go and make disciples of the whole nation. Just to give you some context here, his instruction was this. Do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The application for us is this. A lot of times we think that we have to send out uh, missionaries to uh, the far away from this country and let them work, God's work there. But we have to start from here, where we stand. If you look at Acts chapter 1, Jesus told the disciples, you have to start from Jerusalem, not from Samaria or Judea or towards the end of the world, right? You have to start from Jerusalem where you stand. So it can be your family members, it can be your close friends, or even church members you have to work with. And of course, Matthew chapter 1 says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for because he will save his people from their sins, starting from Israel. And next passage, 7 through 8, as you go, first thing he instructed was, you got to preach. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the one. But if you look at the parallel passage in Mark, they also have this. They went out and preached that man should repent. Repentance has to come together. It's not just, okay, kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hallelujah, let's have a good time. No, you got to repent to enter the kingdom of heaven. At the end, though, it says, freely you received, freely give. Isaiah chapter 55 says the same thing. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Some people, they're charging people for the, okay, I bought this book for this Bible study, so this is how much you're going to pay. If I'm coming over to your church as a guest speaker, this is how much I charge. People just put some price tag on their services. That's not a biblical thing to do because the Bible says, freely you received, freely give. Last time when we had a Bible study, we had a guest. And I gave him some books. And naturally, he asked me, how much are they? No, don't worry about it, just take it. He felt uncomfortable because I think he used to pay those books from church. It's not a good idea to charge people for their preaching and teaching just because we want to break even or make money from there. Then how about pastors or people who are serving at church? Got to serve free of charge. That's what it sounds like. But that's verses 7 and 8. But Jesus continues, Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts or a bag for your journey or even two coats or sandals or a staff for the worker is worthy of his support. You're supposed to spread the gospel for free, but you deserve to be supported by faithful people. It says for the laborer deserves his food. That's the ESV version. They're supposed to make a living out of it. I have to introduce you this passage too in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Because a lot of times people just go from that verse 8 of Matthew chapter 10 saying, freely you receive, freely you give. You know, how can a pastor or elder, whoever serves at church, get paid? That's not a right exegesis of the Bible passage. Because Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 says this, Do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? And other apostles, people in the ministry, they don't work. Church support them. He asks three rhetorical questions. Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? You are at war, but you have to make a living for your family behind? You don't. You just go out and war. You cannot take care of your family by working during the daytime. And who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? 
Hey, we want free service, guys. Pastors and ministers and missionaries. God will provide you. Yes, that's for sure. He provided the church and faithful people to support them and their ministry. That's how it works. So that's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. He continues in verse 8. I am not speaking these things according to human judgment, or does not the law also say these things? You guys know the Old Testament says this. And a little farther down, verses 13 and 14, he says this. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple, and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Right. My message is for free. Any pastor in this world, but they are supposed to be uh, supported by church or some other faithful people. This is not calm and gentle, nice portion of this letter. But let's think about this. Who do we respect as pastors or people in the ministry? Great pastor that I respect. Who comes to your mind? Not a name, but the way they live. They're not interested in money. They're poor. And they always serve, never take a break. Even though they have mortgage pay, car payment, they're okay, God will provide them. They're poor, I know, I feel sorry for them, but too bad. So what we're asking or what we're respecting or feel sorry for is basically poor, easygoing Superman. Uh, so whatever happens, they have to embrace us, forgive us, and love us, but they shouldn't get paid or not much. That's different than what the Bible teaches. 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18 says this. And guess what, though? I don't think a lot of pastors talk about this because they cannot. Because if you do that, including myself, people may think he wants money, right? But think about this, what the Bible says. This is the principle we have to practice. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. In American church, some denominations, these are elders. So some are ruling elders. They're taking care of church admin, church ruling, and church matters. Others are called teaching elders. So there are two eldership there. The teaching elder is the one that we call pastor, like preaching and teaching. So especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching, they're supposed to receive double honor. What does that mean, double honor? You bow down to them twice whenever you meet them? Hello, twice? No. Next verse says, For the scripture says, the Bible says, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. You have to take care of their lives so they can serve the Lord without too concerned about their living. First, Second Timothy and Titus, we call it, pastoral epistle. So that's how we're supposed to apply those things into our church matter. Not just our church, but the, all the churches out there. People may think, oh, he wants more money. And Paul knew that that's going to be the reaction from the people. That's why in the next passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, but I have used none of these things, and I am not writing these things that it will be done so in my case. This is the biblical principle. That's what Paul says. And he was not really that happy about church in Corinth because he said, for it would be better for me to die than have any man make my boast an empty one. I'm just telling you the principle, how it works. So you have to think about humility versus hypocrisy. A lot of times we respect people with hypocrisy. Yeah, I'm okay. I don't care about money, but, but you need money, right, to live. Pastors have family. People respect those people, though. Yeah, I don't need money. I'm fine. But it's good to be honest. So uh, hypocrites, the way they say about their humility and other things, I don't care about the money, I'm fine, when they're not fine, all we see is them, the people who are showing their humility. Very definition of hypocrisy right there. If you go back and revisit the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 
do not pray or do not fast to get an approval from other people. So people can see, oh, you're praying, or people can see, oh, you're fasting. What do they see? They see you doing something. They don't see God. So I'm holier than Jesus, basically. That's what they're saying. Jesus said, workers, they deserve to get paid. But we're saying, I'm fine. Don't pay me. What does that mean? Then what other areas do you just ignore what the Bible says as a pastor? But they're charging for Bible study. That's not the right thing to do. So humility is actually acknowledging what's happening. And if you're not good at singing, but if you're good at teaching, serve the Lord in teaching ministry. That's humility. Whatever God has given you, if you have a lot of money, use that for the kingdom of God. If you don't have much, then you cannot use it anyway. It's just depending on what God blessed you with. The church in Corinth has some issues. The second Corinthians chapter 11 says this. I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you, you people in church in Corinth. I'm serving you, but other people are helping me. Not from you, but other churches, other faithful people that I know. And it continued. And when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone. So what did he do? Paul worked. If you look at Acts chapter 18, 1 through 3, he worked as tent maker. Where did he work? Acts chapter 18, 1 through 3, he was in Corinth. Those people didn't care about him. You work day and night. You serve us. I don't care about your living because other people are helping you. Oh, maybe you're making a lot of money by tent making business. So we're not going to help you. They didn't care. He said, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren come from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. People from Macedonia, who are those? There are three main churches we can think of in the book of Acts. Philippi, Berea, and Thessalonica. They fully supplied my need, and in everything I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so, people in Corinth. Not a happy camper. I'd rather die instead of asking you to pay me more, right? That's what he said. And I'm going to keep it this way, and it will continue to do so. That was church in Corinth. So when he said, I kept myself from being a burden to you, the same expression was used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He said very similar thing here. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you. We proclaim to you the gospel of God. In the context, church in Philippi, we had Lydia, who was a big business woman. So they must be doing okay there. But Berea and church in Thessalonica, they're very poor. A lot of more slaves. Slaves don't have anything much, right? So they're very poor, but they're the ones who's been supporting Paul and his leadership. So when Paul wrote this letter to church in Thessalonica, he said the same thing. We work day and night, so we don't want to be burdened to you. That's verse 9. But verse 8 says this. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. Why is it different? Church in Corinth versus church in Thessalonica. Church in Corinth, they were able, but they decided not to support Paul. No matter how much time he spent, no matter how long he taught, they didn't budge. Versus church in Thessalonica, Paul knew they're poor. They couldn't support him, so he was working. But he was happy to do so for them. The main reason was this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, he's saying this in his greeting portion. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love 
and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of our God and Father. So when he thought about these people in Thessalonica, he remembered their work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in Christ Jesus. It made them smile. So their sacrifice, in a way, the same sacrifice that they did in Corinth, completely different mindset. And it continues. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So they became imitators of the leaders and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. They received the word with the joy. That's a one good part. Some people reject it. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. As a preacher and pastor or teacher, the utmost joy that we can see and witness is people changing their lives, become exemplary in their lives as a Christian. A lot of us are married. We have kids when they're little, not because they're the best of the best, when they listen to us and do the right thing and stay in the right path, that's what makes us happy, right? As a pastor, when I don't see any changes, then it, it hurts. What's going on? The Word of God is preached, and then they don't receive it, or they receive it, but there's no change in their lives. It hurts. But when you see the change, development, improvement, then that's it. Nothing else. So there are two different groups, as you can see. And let's go back to the passage we're working on. And this is exactly what Jesus told them again. In whatever city or village you enter, we read it together, right? Inquire who is worthy in it and stay at his house until you leave that city. It's not just anyone, but you have to inquire who is worthy in that city. The second bullet point says, as you enter the house, give it your greeting if the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. But if it is not worthy, you have to do otherwise. First part, if the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. That's why a lot of times when we visit someone's house, we sit down and pray. That's what we do. But if it is not worthy, take back your blessing of peace. It doesn't belong to them. Very harsh message there. And I don't know if pastors out there actually preach this this way. There's distinction between who is worthy and who is not worthy. We're not saying you preach the gospel once and if he or she rejects it, then forget about it. That's not what we're saying. After all these ministry, all these years of work, if they continue to reject receiving the word of God, continue to live in sin, then it's time to move on. And whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words, as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. So Jewish tradition is like this. When the Jews were passing by Samaria from Judea to Galilee area, they usually go around because they don't want to go through that area. They don't want to deal with these unclean people. But if you have to go through there, as soon as you cross the border to Judea or Galilee, they take their dust off from their feet. Because I don't want to have anything to do with this unclean people. That's what they did. And that's exactly what Jesus was telling them. You don't want to have anything to do with those people who reject you and your message. The Matthew chapter 7, Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine. So you have to find who is worthy to spend time and effort to spread a gospel message and have fellowship with them. So if you look at the entire picture of the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the Bible clearly tells us that there's a distinction between chosen ones and who are not chosen. Since we don't know who is chosen, we have to just go out and spread a gospel message as messengers. That's our job. But if you end up spending too much time to those people who are unrepentant and rejecting the message, then you have to stop. Some people may say that's not love. 
but that's what the Bible teaches. The consequence is, truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Those people who reject the message, those people who don't listen to you, it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in, that, in the judgment day. Really, only three people survived from the Sodom and Gomorrah. Fire and brimstone came down from heaven and everybody died. How can it be better there? But the Bible says, yeah, it's going to be worse than that. So we don't want to be there. So what do we have to do? We have to examine ourselves and see if I am worthy of receiving the word of God. Am I one of those people who are ready to hear the voice of God? And then, yes, Lord, I'm going to follow you. So Ecclesiastes chapter 12 is the last chapter of the book. Chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says this. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. If you go down to verse 5 from that chapter, we're talking about death. So while you're alive, remember your Creator. If it was written by Solomon, King Solomon, he's the one who started with vanity of vanities. Everything is vanity. Right. What's the point of working hard? What's the point of doing this? What's the point of living? As the most wise person we ever lived on this earth, conclusion was this. Remember your creator in the days of your youth while you're still alive. After you die, there's no second chance. That was verses 1 and 2. Last two verses of the chapter. Let's read that together. Ready? Go. The conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep His commandments, because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. The conclusion of this wise person in this book is fear God and keep His commandments because this applies to every person. And he says, God will bring every act to judgment. But let's go back to this applies to every person. That can be translated in this way. ESV did a good job. This is the whole duty of man. That's our duty. Right? Remember verse 1 says, remember your Creator. That means we are creatures. As a creature, we have to remember that we have to fear God and keep His commandments because that's our duty. When you get a job somewhere, your duty is working for that company and they're going to pay you. License, same thing. You have to maintain the requirements there. So my prayer for you is, we have to think about our lives and see, am I worthy of receiving God's grace and mercy and His Word? And am I faithful in terms of fulfilling a duty as the one who's created by God in His image? If you're already doing a good job in that sense, then praise the Lord and keep up the good work. If you're not sure about that, pray and ask for God's grace. So he can touch your heart and transform with the Holy Spirit.